If you've been waiting on the one military aviation podcast that covers it all, well, you found it. Because on this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, two retired naval aviators with over 60 years of combined service and thousands of flight hours between them, join us to discuss the legendary F-4 Phantom II. What the design resulted in was not only a fighter that could do the uh, air-to-air mission, but they could also carry bombs. Aerial combat in Vietnam. We did barrel roll, got behind the other MiG, and shot him off Rookie and Ken's tail. And uh, that was our second kill of the day. Prisoners of war. And so I reached down with my good hand, ejected us both from the airplane. Next thing I knew, I'm hanging in a chute, coming down. Uh, land in a rice paddy. They came along, dragged me up, and stripped me down of all my gear. They took me down to the main road, threw me in the back of the truck, and took me to Hanoi. And best of all, reconciliation among former adversaries. Out of the six pilots, two of them were still alive, and I got to meet one of them. And uh, we sat down at the table and... 43 years later, and we're remembering it the same way. Detroit, we got Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots, Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. everyone and welcome to episode 52 of the fighter pilot podcast i'm jello joining me is sunshine what's up dude hey jello not much how are you these days uh, i'm pretty good thanks we have an exciting episode coming up on the f4 phantom 2 you had a chance to listen although you weren't able to make it for the interview no sadly it wasn't but a uh, pretty epic discussion you guys the three of you had there and uh, just all sorts of facts pretty amazing yep well, we will get to that as we normally do here in a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, what's new in your world? Well, just uh, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. My girls are still out of school, so enjoying that. we got family in town. How about you? Oh, yes, it is summertime. My boys are out as well. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, today I'm up in Los Angeles in my deceased father's home. Helping oh, my, okay. Yeah, helping my sister do some transition type stuff and we're preparing for his memorial on august 2nd it's a friday he'll be Uh, laid to rest at the la national cemetery just off the 405 freeway next to ucla where he's an alum as was i and he was from la and he'll be buried with his fellow military members so we think that's a fitting tribute to the end of a very long and full life absolutely do you uh, is it kind of nostalgic going through some stuff up there in his house Oh, it's both nostalgic and funny. You find letters that he wrote to different people, and you see little tidbits that remind you of certain things. It's, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> but, you know, those who have not put some thought into end-of-life planning, you know, we all hear mm-hmm. you got to do that. And, boy, my sister and I can tell you, you certainly do, because even <laughs> with a living trust like he had, yeah. uh, it, it just there's a lot to it. You know, there's silly rules like the even the California DMV won't let you change the registration of his car for 40 hmm. days after you send them a death certificate. So it's uh, just crazy stuff. But yeah, you know, it's just part of the way things go when, when you lose a loved one, but we're, we're plodding through it. How'd they come up with 40 days? Is that based on the great floods from way back when? This is California sunshine. I'm not <laughs> thinking that's the case, <laughs> but I, All right. I don't know. They probably but we took, digress. Yeah. yeah, they probably took what they thought was reasonable, which is 10 days and said, okay, if 10 is good, <laughs> 40 is better. <laughs> Boom. All right, anyway, California. That's right. Well, dude, you and I have had a busy couple weeks. Let's see. What did we do? We had a live listener question and answer segment with episode 50 Hero Turkey, and we did that at your house. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Good. It was good to have Turkey back and a lot of good questions, I thought. A lot of, actually, a lot of good answers, let me say. So ah. just a good time. What a great American, isn't he? Oh, he's good. Yes, for sure. Now, some people have been calling us out, Sunshine, on our lack of studio quality facilities. So I ah. know we've got some work going on for your deep dive stuff with the green screens yes. and the lights. Yes. Didn't you? Uh, you ended up getting some lapel mics, I think, right? 
I did, and then I found a way, I think, to hook a DSLR into make it a webcam. So we'll Ooh, see if that provides right. some better resolution. Yeah. So okay. think, let's just say things are in work. Well, and I like to think that the listeners forgive us because, in this case, the viewers, because it's the quality of the content, not necessarily the beauty of the hosts in this case. <laughs> Medium. Uh, yes. Myself, at least. Uh, I've heard that you're good looking. Well, anyway. Well, not, 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 not when it comes to HD. <laughs> I don't think I am. <laughs> uh, so, listeners, viewers, bear with us. One day we will have a BVR production studio and provide you Hollywood <laughs> quality content. So anyway, uh, let's see. What else did we do? We had a musing post from a guest who yeah, reflected the on being married mm-hmm. to a fighter pilot. That's right. Thank mm-hmm. you. That was a good and read. then you and I released another behind the scenes and re- remind the viewers what that one was about. Yeah, so basically looking at final checkers. So it's a helmet cam of one of the troopers up there on the flight deck and steps through final checks. And I think, did we have a misspeak or two, Jello, on that? You know, we do almost every behind the scenes. And the wonderful thing <laughs> about our viewers fault, yeah. is they don't hold back. <laughs> They'll let <laughs> us know. So one of the things I was schooled on is that the troubleshooters will be in white, but a final checker could be anyone. And so the young lady who was the counterpart in that video was a maintenance person who had the final checker qual, qual. but was not yeah. a troubleshooter. So that we were reminded of that. This is stuff we knew once, Sunshine, and have forgotten in retirement. And mm-hmm. then the other thing is the T on the helmet. It isn't for troubleshooter. That's for AT. So that young lady is an ah. avionics technician. And then, of course, if it was an E, it'd be an avionics electrician. An O would be ordnance. Oh, gosh, what else is there? There's power plants and airframes and all yeah, kinds of AD, different things. Yeah, AD. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all sorts of goodness. So, yeah, okay. But, you know, I've said in jest in different places before. I think I've learned more <laughs> since retiring on certain things than I did when I was 25 years in because you got so many listeners out there and viewers who know what they're talking about and they don't hold back. They'll let us know when we're wrong and we, we don't mind. At least I don't. No, no, I appreciate the corrections. I kind of, kind of call it backup if you will. So, yeah. and yeah, and even the listener questions. So, uh, the, uh, the weekly, let's see the, the Friday tech talk, if you will, the next picture that comes out is going to be based on a listener question that we got recently. So it should be pretty good. Oh, excellent. Well, speaking of that, we got almost all the way caught up with our written questions with Turkey. That was wonderful. I think we're nice. down to about a page and a half. But okay. we do have some phone calls that we need to answer. So, Sunshine, what do you say we cover some of those today? Uh, but before you answer that, realizing you listened <laughs> to me and Fingers and Tiger ramble on and on, that was a long interview. A so, long, but, you know, it kind of flew, though, Jello. It was long, you're right, but I didn't, I never found myself looking at my watch. Ah, very So that good. was real good, yeah. Well, in the interest of, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure what it is in the interest of, but I think as we <laughs> produce all this, we will end up splitting it into two, and we'll separate it okay. by a few days or a week or something. Yeah. And uh, that just, it makes it uh, tenable. I've heard from people that sit in their car when they get to work at the end of their commute, who, if the episode's not over, they get yelled at because they're late. So we, we don't want to be the cause for anyone losing their jobs. I hear you. Yeah, good call. So uh, <laughs> now when it comes to these, uh, so the dial-in questions, if you will, do you want to knock out about four of them today? Sure. Why don't we? Let's play this first one. And I think it's from a local. Okay. Hi, Jello. My name is Max Hagman. I'm from San Diego, California. And uh, I recently got a scholarship for the Air Force ROTC program here at San Diego State. I've been listening to your podcast for a while. I think it's really motivating to hear some of the great stories that you have in uh, So is the Sunshine. And I was wondering, uh, any advice for ROTC cadets going in, how to get the best experience in the ROTC program and to better yourself and become a better officer in the future? Thanks. Love your podcast. Bye. All right. Great question, Matt. Mm-hmm. Thank you for Indeed. calling in. And he, he's local, so we That's... need to probably get in touch with him. So I have a lot bouncing through my head, and I'll try to keep okay. this as brief as I can. Because one thing here, Sunshine, is you and I and the rest of the team have talked about creating a forum or a community for young people like Matt mm-hmm. who are making their way into training programs. And at some point, if they make their way through and they stick with us, they could help out the generation coming behind them. So we're looking to start serving this category a little bit better. Mm-hmm. It could be a closed Facebook group. Okay. It could be a forum on our website. It could be a Google group. We haven't decided yet. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, you know, times have changed since I went through ROTC. It's mm-hmm. been, I graduated in 1992. So I'm assuming Jeez, that dude, wasn't you're old. even alive yet. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, but I, I'm guessing 
my advice would still stand, and it's probably not that different than your advice, Sunshine, even though you didn't do ROTC, but Mm -mm. I would say that you apply yourself to whatever you're doing, Mm -hmm. learn as much as you can, be as helpful as you can to those who are doing it and those around you, get as much from it as you can, internalize the lessons, wear a smile on your face and move on to the next thing and, and just try to always do your best. I mean, Gosh, I wish I could tell a 30-year younger Jello this uh, advice because I know I certainly didn't do it. But with the experience now of, uh, or the benefit of experience, I should say, I feel like that's really all there is to it. And I, I wish I could go back, but I don't know. Is that what do you think there, Sunshine? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Now, I, I obviously didn't get a chance to do ROTC. I went through that small trade school over by the Severn River. But um, I would say <laughs> practicing time management. Because it's some, uh-huh. it's somewhat inconsequential in a college, I would say. It's it's consequential, but it's not as much as in the fleet. And also, I would try to learn how to accept criticism. Ah, you know, don't take it personal or personally. Excuse me, it's all business, and keep it at that. And I think that'll also help you out in the aviation community, wouldn't you say, Jello? Oh, absolutely. You have to be able to be told that you suck, and to yeah. wear, <laughs> wear a poker face, but also to internalize that. To use that word again, to say that you know what. He's right. I did not do that maneuver or whatever it was well, and I need to go do it better. And so what do I need to do to do that? The other thing I would add, and I and I tell anyone who reaches out with this kind of question, is don't forget to lead a balanced life. And that mm-hmm. is make sure you save time for exercising because that's important, but also mm-hmm. go have fun. I mean, if you like to golf, go golfing. If you like to fly fish, go fly fishing. If you uh, like helping or volunteering or family's important, do those things because it'll make you so much more effective, all of those, exercise included, when you are working towards your goal. And so I think balance is important also. Totally agree, man. Well put. All right. Should we roll on to our next one? You betcha. Hi, I'm Griffin13 from Arizona. And I was wondering if you guys will ever do an episode about the F-35 or the F-22 Raptor or the B-17 Bomber because my great-grandfather flew the B-17 in World War II and I would like you to tell the story of him, his story about, and his story is he will, he was flying over Germany in World War II and crashed in Germany and hiked all the way to Switzerland on foot. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right, Griffin, thanks for calling in. Appreciate it from uh, the good old, it's probably hot there in your desert this time of year. But uh, thank you very much for the suggestions. Yeah, we've been working on an F-35 and F-22 pilots, and I did go to the Air Force Test Pilot School, so I got some buddies that flew those. So hopefully sooner than later, I'll get to catch up with, I'll just use call signs here, Rost, and then uh, Pimp and any of the other bros that I can up there. So, And then the B-17, What a that's so cool about uh, his grandfather crashing in Germany, not cool, but then also hiking to Switzerland. So, <laughs> I mean, dude. I mean, that's a movie unto itself, you oh, know what man. I'm saying? So Absolutely. That is so cool. But um, if you think back to the, uh, gosh, that's, I think that was the third most built or produced, I should say, bomber back then. You know, it's, I think it was the B-24 and the Junkers, Ju-88, and then the B-17 Flying Fortress. So, because remember, the 8th Air Force had it out of the uh, England, right? And then the 15th Air Force had it out of Italy. And I think that we dropped about, or the Allies dropped about 1.3 million tons of bombs on Germany, and the Flying Fortress was responsible for dropping 43% of that. Wow. So pretty crazy. And not only was it a bomber, it was a drone controller, a transport, and a uh, submarine warfare platform, as well as a search and rescue platform. So it had a lot of different missions, and boy, did it get the job done, you know. So, and then, of course, there's the movie, right, The Memphis Belle, That's about right. the uh, B-17. And to my knowledge, I think there are about 10 that are still airworthy in the U.S. So um, anyway, that'd be great. I would absolutely love to do a B-17 uh, story, uh, excuse me, interview one of these days. Well, and on that note, Sunshine, we have a museum of aviation somewhere in the Atlanta suburb area, I'm told, who oh, has invited okay. us to come out, and they have one that's flying, to your point, in air shows. Sweet. And so if we can't get Griffin's grand, great-grandfather, which I'm presuming, although he didn't say so, could be by gone by now. I don't know how else to hmm. say that gently. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, then, Departed you know, the pattern. Yeah. That's right. We'll have to get those who, who, uh, who are around. But hey, you know what? Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, Sunshine. I wasn't very brave at 13 years old. Good on you, Griffin, for calling in that question. Dude, that's, that's epic. Yeah, I was uh, quite the introvert at 13, so <laughs> good on him. Uh, you still are. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Hey, Jello. This is Ben from Atlanta, Georgia. 
listen, I had a Top Gun theme question in the spirit of the 50th anniversary just having happened. Read your fantastic article you wrote about reflecting on the 50th anniversary of the school. Really enjoyed it. My question pertains to the career track and how it relates to how aviators get selected to go to Top Gun and what they do afterwards. It seems like just reading the history of a lot of folks who went through in the 70s and 80s that there were quite a few guys who went to Top Gun that did not end up becoming Top Gun instructors or instructors at weapon schools that just maybe went back to their squadron, did a tour as a training officer or what have you. And then, you know, a lot of them went on to do other things, including uh, quite a few of them going to test pilot school. From my understanding now, it seems like uh, a lot of the folks who are in the community now sort of have to choose between whether or not they want to go to Top Gun and, you know, be an instructor or they want to go the, the TPS route. So anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that's changed over the years. And uh, also just want to say thanks to you and Sunshine and the rest of the crew at the podcast. I really, really enjoy listening to all the content you guys put out. And I'm um, looking forward to many more uh, great podcasts in the future. Take care and have an awesome weekend, guys. Thank you. All right, Ben. Great question. So a multi-part question. Let's see if I remember everything you asked here. So the first thing is Top Gun itself changed over the years. When it first came out, it was called the Power Projection Course. And to your point and to the point of the movie, Top Gun, what happened was Pilot and Rio were selected from a squadron usually towards the you know second half of their time in the squadron, to come attend Top Gun. And then they went back to their very same squadron. So they just went away on temporary duty, let's call it. And then when they came back, they were the newly anointed knights of the air, and they would share <laughs> their knowledge with everybody else. Now, of course, that's a story unto itself, because not every skipper or other pilot in the squadron wanted to hear all that, but times have definitely changed. Now it's different. And oh yeah, so to that point, when they left that JO tour that they were there for, they could go on and do other things, whether it was instruct at the FRS or go to TPS or whatever. Now, these days, you don't go during your first tour. You go at the end of your first tour. Mm -hmm. And then once you go to Top Gun, that dictates where you go after that. And so there are a handful out in the VX community, Sunshine. You probably saw some there with you out in China Lake. I did. Yep. And then some go to the VFA FRSs. Some stay at the Top Gun and uh, the other commands, if you will, or departments within Nautic, as they call it now. And then some go to the satellites, if you will, which are the weapon schools on each coast. So it's a different story now. I don't know of too many who went these days to Top Gun and TPS. Do you know any, Sunshine? I just know two, uh, call sign Lamb Chop. I believe it was a little angry man boy. Can't hack our program. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, though, uh, Lamb Chop could hack the program, both uh, because he's got, he was duly anointed, if you will. He's got okay. the Top Gun and the TPS patches, and uh, he's doing actually very well in, in the Navy still. So, oh. And then the other, the other guy was Sausage, last name Dean, so no real you know, clever acronym there. Right. But anyway, Marine type, uh, another great American, and he did both uh, Top Gun and uh, TPS. Excellent. All right. Well, I think we have time for one more question, Sunshine. You want to take this one? You betcha. Hey, Jello, how's it going, man? My name's Mason Hilua, calling from Riverside, California. I'm not going to lie, I party with my friends a little while ago, pretty drunk right now, and I've got fighter pilots on the brain, man. You've done something to me, your podcast. So listen to this. Riverside, California, really close to March Air Force Base. Now, the other day, a plane crashed, an F-16, I do believe. Now, it crashed right through the business of some warehouse now because i've listened to your show i've seen all these planes flying over my house i'm like oh that one's a transport that one's a tanker i'm learning something from you i appreciate it back to my question the pilot i believed was a part of norad you'll explain what that is in a second he failed he bailed out because of hydraulic failure now what are the ramifications of crashing what if it was entirely his fault? What happens? What if it was entirely the plane's fault? What happens? What happens to the business? What happens to the plane? Money, politics. Give me a little perspective. Love the podcast. Keep it up. All right, uh, Mason. So thanks for drunk dialing, question mark. <laughs> but I would ask that you, uh, first off, don't drink a podcast, dude. So, <laughs> well, but thanks for your question. Sunshine. 
uh, the listeners have been asking us to do like a, a drunk history style <laughs> podcast. So I don't know <laughs> if, if Mason's uh, uh, breaking the mold here, you, you know, anyway, sorry. Yeah. He might've been the first out of the gate on that one. That's so right. we'll see. Um, yeah. So I guess back in May and I was up in Alaska, so totally missed this whole thing that happened in SoCal here, but Back in uh, mid-May, there was a crash of the 114th Fighter Wing Air National Guard F-16 out of Sioux Falls. He was coming in on the uh, South Flow runway there on March, and there, right next to the Highway 215, there's actually dash cam footage, believe it or not, of a guy heading south. And in the dash cam, you can see off on the left-hand side, which would be the east, you see the ejection, and then you see this plane unmanned now, so almost a drone, right, waffling across, yes, across a crowded highway, and it crashes into a Seawater Incorporated warehouse. So it just it burrows right into a, a warehouse ceiling. So I guess they said they had hide failure. So anyway, looking at that, there's um, there's a couple of things that happen as soon as kind of uh, switches that are flipped as soon as there's a crash, right? So you got the Jagman, which is for the Navy. Anyway, I'll talk about the Navy procedures. You got the Judge Advocate General Manual. So it's the lawyers. They come out and they're going to look at what happened and establish culpability. But then we'll, we'll call those, and, and I love my JAG, local JAG, but we're going to call those the guys in the black hats. Now, you also have the guys in the white hats, right? Jealous, you're looking at your aviation mishap board. Hold on, hold on. So, i got to interrupt you. So are we talking like old-day cowboy movies where the bad guy was in a black hat and the good guy was in a white hat? Oh, <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't use that reference. Yeah, uh, so, but... Uh, all right. Yeah, well, the, the JAG... <laughs> the JAG man's going to come out. The lawyers will come out and try to f- establish culpability. And then the uh, a, a parallel effort, but they don't. They shouldn't be talking to each other. Stay on separate sides of the fence. You've got the aviation mishap board, and they're going to try to figure out what went wrong so that there are some lessons learned. And mm. then from there, hopefully, subsequent pilots or other pilots will take those lessons on board and not do the same thing. So, so there's two investigations, a legal one and then a safety one, right? So um, that'll that'll play out. And then based on what the AMB finds and what the JAG man finds, the pilot could, at least in the Navy, he's going to go through a, a FENAB or a Field Naval Aviation Evaluation Board, which is uh, some of his seniors, right, are going to basically judge him. And they're going to say, hey, you get to keep your wings or, hey, you get to keep your wings and not fly, or you don't keep your wings at all. So there's kind of three consequences, if you will, or outcomes, mm-hmm. excuse me. Uh, one thing, though, when we talk about culpability and all that stuff, there's something back from, I think it was from the 50s, called the Ferris Doctrine. And it's a law that prohibits uh, basically active duty military personnel and their families to sue the government for negligence. So if uh, a plane crashes and somebody, a military service member, dies in that plane crash, the, uh, his, his dependents can't actually sue the United States government. So, and that's just an extension from an English common law concept called sovereign immunity. Ah. So anyway, so yeah, so the military can't sue the government, but the military and, and let's say the survivors, there's what the word I was looking for. They can actually sue contractors if there's negligence found there. Okay. So um, I guess if you think Jello back to, it was December of 2008, VMFAT, so the training squadron here in San Diego, 101, I should say, excuse me, had that crash into that house. Do you remember right. that? Yes, I do. Yeah, and they killed four people. Uh, the, the, the plane ended up, so the pilot ejected, and then the unmanned plane flew into a house and caught another subsequent or adjacent house on fire, killed a wife, two daughters, and a mother-in-law. And I guess the, the surviving husband sued the government for because he's a civilian for $56 million. And after the court case was uh, heard and ruled upon, he got $17.8 million. So there is precedence for civilians suing the government for loss, you know, but not military members. Well, and to Mason's point, I don't think that the owners of the warehouse have to wait to sue. I, I believe the military shows up and says, okay, here's what you've oh. lost, almost like an insurance yes. claim, and they're going to make yes. an offer. But yes, to your point, in that case, this gentleman lost his whole family, and that's got to be devastating. Let's not even start thinking about that. But yeah. you know, that, there's, there's obviously a lot more to that, but the company that owned the warehouse and then the tenant inside i'm sure they were compensated by the legal yes. folks of the military yeah very good Absolutely. Whoa, that was that was thorough dude that's almost like its own <laughs> podcast <laughs> uh, all right 
Excellent. Well, hey, we've got a couple more, but let's save those for another time since we're getting caught up anyway. That's good stuff. Yeah. And let's... what do you say we get headed towards the interview here? Dude, let's dive in. All right, I'm so excited. Before we do, though, I want to tell everybody, to me, tiger and fingers sound a little mm-hmm. bit the same. So what I've done <laughs> is I, uh, for those of you listening on headphones or maybe in your car, uh, I've moved tiger a little bit into your left ear and I move fingers okay. a little bit into your right and I'm in the middle. And so, so you might use that as... As help for who's speaking at the time. Otherwise, I think it'll be clear and it's just a great discussion anyway. So let's jump to it. Awesome. All right. Today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are talking about the F4 Phantom 2. And to help me do that, I have two gentlemen in studio with me who both flew it. Did you guys ever fly together, by the way? Nope. Nope. Never no? did, okay. huh? All We're right. always in different squadrons. Oh, too bad. Well, We're we'll get to Top that. Gun just briefly, but <laughs> yeah, but we didn't fly together there either. No. All right. Well, I need to introduce both of you so that the listener can hear your voice and get to know you. And we will start with you, John Kerr, a retired Rear Admiral, United States Navy Reserve, call sign Tiger, but also known as John Ed. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the John Ed comes from a college thing, but uh, okay. and it kind of stuck with me because I was in ROTC at at Princeton, and we had uh, three guys in the, in the ROTC unit that all came to Miramar about the same time, and oh. uh, that's how the John Ed thing came along. All right, but well, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, after uh, pre-flight, I went to uh, uh, Miramar. Uh, my first squadron was VF one fourteen. Okay, a couple of cruises uh, there, and then to, uh, to Top Gun after that. And then I transitioned to the reserves and spent about thirty five years in the Navy between active and, and reserve uh, oh, wow. time. A lot of good time, a lot of fun. Uh, after that, or during that time, I was also with Delta, so I spent 30 years with Delta flying, and I'm still flying today. No kidding. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, also on microphone with us is retired U.S. Navy Captain Jack Ench, call sign Fingers. Hello, sir. How are you doing, Joel? <laughs> I'm great, and thanks for making this happen. Now, you and I have been working on this for months. Yeah, I know. You're persistent. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I knew the listener would enjoy hearing about the F-4 Phantom too, and I also knew that it would be great to have a crew. Now, John Ed, you were a pilot. Yes. And Jack, you were a real. Real. Okay. Right. Well, give us your quick background, if you would. Where well, have you been, and what are you doing now? Born and raised Springfield, Illinois. Uh, went to Illinois State University. Okay. And um, got interested in the Navy when uh, I was getting ready to graduate and saw some um, young pilots in their gold wings and in the student union recruiting guys to come okay. in. So I, uh, my wife and I just, I, we got married while we were still in school. And I said, hey, well, that'd be fun to go in four years. Wouldn't that be fun, you know, <laughs> get out of the cornfields of Illinois and see a little bit of the country and the world, you know, and. She agreed that that might be a good idea, so uh, I joined up and um, spent thirty some years and thirty, a little over thirty years, as uh, what's the saying goes, and the rest is history. So, uh, it, <laughs> well, uh, come on, you're going to need to give us a little more detail than that. So you started off in okay, training, well, of course, and okay. the F four. I, I went through um, went through AOCS and then pre flight down in Pensacola, and I um, I originally came in as a I was recruited as a pilot, but I was twenty six. And after I'd finished got my commission, they said, oh, guess what? Year two would be a pilot. Oh. This is 1965. All right. So, you know, so um, bait and switch. Uh-huh. So I said, okay, I'm going to, I'll be a Rio and uh, I'll go into F4s, which I did. And uh, came out to Miramar, just like John. And uh, I had two combat cruises in F4s on uh, Coral Sea and Ranger in VF-21. And then after shore duty, came back and had two more cruises in Vietnam and uh, F4s, F4Bs. That's all I ever was in, F4B squad. Okay. And uh, that was VF-161 off Midway, two cruises Midway, uh, second one of which I did not finish. Uh, 285 missions, then I took unaccompanied shore duty in Vietnam. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> all right. But after that, uh, you know, I went on various other things, had my own F-14 squadron and— uh, and I at Naval Air Station Key West and uh, retired as the commander of Naval Training Center here in San Diego. Wow. And that was, uh, that was my Navy career. And now the Midway is a museum here in San Diego. Yes, I mean, and, uh, so I'm not I'm, trying to <clears throat> say anything here, Jack, but that... <clears throat> well, it's... <laughs> I'll, I'll be 82 in November. Okay. So I'm, you know, I'm just waiting for him to stuff me and <laughs> put me on display. Well, you don't look a day over <clears throat> 81. I mean, yeah. you're looking pretty good. Okay, I'm not, that, that I'm was not, supposed to be funny. Yeah, I'm not 82 yet, <laughs> but every airplane I've ever flown and every ship I've ever been on has either, either been decommissioned or on a pedestal somewhere at a museum. <laughs> yeah, me too. All right. And did you do some time also, John Ed, in uh, Vietnam? 
I did. I had two tours uh, in Vietnam in the VF-114. Okay. And that was a squadron that uh, Jack was a skipper of a, oh. a few years later. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I had VF-114, flying F-14s in the early 80s. Oh, wow. So that was... Uh, okay. Fighting aardvarks. Once an aardvark, yeah, always an aardvark. That's very right. good. That's right. Well, in this very studio, we had a crew come talk to us about the F-14 Tomcat in all its flavors. A couple months ago, I don't remember what episode it was, but not important. It was a very successful episode, and I assume this one will be as well. So appreciate you gentlemen taking the time out of your afternoon. And let's talk about the F-4 Phantom. So first off, usually what we talk about on the show is what was it designed to do? Now, I hate to say it, but Wikipedia has become a resource for me, and you never know if you can trust it or not. But it sounds like, to me, McDonnell Design at the time said, hey, we think the Navy's going to need a new fighter. And through many derivations and iterations, they ended up with what now looks to be and is known as the F-4. But I think at one time it was going to be more of a fighter bomber, and then it was going to be an interceptor, and now, or at least when it was operational, it was kind of both. Does that sound true? And by the way, the questions will just be to whoever wants to jump in on this. So, <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, McDonnell Douglas had been building airplanes, McDonnell, uh, mm -hmm. for the Navy for a while, and they had, a, they had an idea that uh, I think was filling a gap, and that was the long-range intercept mission. But what the design result, resulted in was a, not only a, a fighter that could do the air-to-air uh, -air mission, and do the long-range mission in that they had a Sparrow missile, not a Phoenix uh, link mm -hmm. missile, but they could also carry bombs, and it was a, it was a pretty effective uh, bomber. And mm -hmm. a lot of the, the bombs that were dropped in Vietnam were mostly by the attack community in in the Navy, but there's a tremendous number of, of fighter missions flown by F-4s, both Air Force and Navy, right. that were bombers. Okay. Yeah, because originally they, the, as my understanding was that McDonald was going to develop a fighter. Mm -hmm. But the Navy decided that the F-8 and the, uh, the F-9F Tiger, that would serve their purposes as, mm -hmm. for as a fighter. So after many iterations, they finally went to McDonald and said, okay, what we want is a long-range interceptor for fleet defense. Right. And that's what the, finally came out to be the F-4. Because you got to remember that, you know, this, we're talking in the late 50s and early 60s. Mm -hmm. It came into the service, what, in 60, I think? I think it entered in 60. That's right. And... Uh, so that was in the Cold War when the Russian bombers and badgers and everything were, were you know, overflying uh, the fleet and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. that's what came out of the, uh, you know, was uh, what's the old thing about a camel as a uh, horse that was designed by committee. Well, that's what <laughs> the Phantom came out to be. Okay. <laughs> well, and because of that role then, and we can skip ahead here to some of the why does it look the way it looks kind of thing, one of the features of the early Phantoms, at least, was that it was designed without an internal gun. That's right. And the idea being that they felt that this would be able to do everything at arm's reach, or yeah. arm's length, I guess. Well, it's, uh, again, it's shortly after the Korean War and the jet age, and the reasoning then was, of course, we always fight last year's war. We mm. never look ahead, <laughs> I don't think, that the, the age of the dogfight was over with. And that with the long-range missiles, you would be able to stand off and you wouldn't be engaged. So uh, I think that and probably the weight consideration for the Navy, because coming aboard a ship, you know, mm. well, if we don't really need the gun, why put it in there? So that's that's my thought on it anyway, John. Okay. Uh, two things I think, uh, this is opinion, I think the gun is an asset in some areas. I think in a fighter, especially the F-4, it was more of a detriment than an asset because the F-4E, as a, for instance, the Air Force airplane, has a gun. Uh, but when you put all that weight in the nose, you really reduce its ability to pitch the airplane mm -hmm. and fight the airplane well. Yeah. And I flew F-4, I flew all of them just about, but in the end, the best F-4 I ever flew was the F4S and it had maneuver slats and a very light nose because it didn't have a gun up there. Mm -hmm. And the kill ratio in Vietnam with guns is is minute. Uh, I mean, we had you know, a handful of gun kills in in the Vietnam. None in the Air Force. I mean, none in the by the F4 in the Navy. And I think three or four maybe with the F8s, and that was it. Mm -hmm. I'll take that back. Spad had a gun kill. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> A1. That's right. yeah. All right. Good. Yeah, that's okay. right. Most of the other were missiles. That's right. And very few uh, sparrows. Very few. Right. Fine. right. It was Unlike the, the Air Force, which had a lot of yeah. know, sparrow kills. Yeah, so we did have some trouble with that. But correct me if I'm wrong, part of the reason that Top Gun exists is because of the initial troubles we had, both with dogfighting and some of the sparrow performance and people shooting out of the right zones for the even the Sidewinder to work. And lo and behold, Dan Pedersen gets the nod to start the school and 
fingers you and I, in fact, John, you were there too, right? Uh, yeah, I uh, was. A few weeks ago, we all met for the 50th anniversary. So uh, I guess you can mm-hmm. look at things as being a detriment, but sometimes it's for the greater good in the long term. Well, right. that's, that's true because uh, with this idea that the air of the dogfight's over with, uh, the training, actual air-to-air combat training, mm-hmm. Just dried up. They they did away with what was the old uh, Fagu? Uh, Fagu, yeah. Oh, uh, fleet air gunnery unit. Yeah, that's right. right. It was like that out in the central. So, mm-hmm. And so when the hot war starts again in Vietnam, we've got a whole generation of uh, naval aviators that have grown up without that dog that skill set. Mm-hmm. Skill set, and uh, they're, we're flying out, shooting out of uh, range, out of envelope, and all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. As far as that, so that's what happened when Frank Alt who was the first the skipper of my first carrier, USS Coral Sea. <laughs> okay. What a guy. Wow. All right. Well, we should have an episode on that sometime. So if uh, my records show correctly here, about 5,000, almost 200 Phantoms built over the years, served from 1960 to about 1996 or so. I think there's still some countries flying. Then we'll get to that in a moment. And at one point I have written here, the Air Force, so it was a Navy aircraft initially. That's right. And then everyone loved it so much, the Air Force ended up flying it, as did the Marine Corps. And the Air Force called it the F-110 Spectre for a little bit. And I think that was quickly dropped. But that's interesting because then the F-111 is pretty well known, but I'd never heard of the F-110. I think that the uh, Air Force, the... uh, it's my opinion. They tried to name it something else because <laughs> it stuck in their craw that they were flying a Navy-developed airplane. Uh-huh. <clears throat> well, to that point, the aircraft that they flew could land on a carrier. In other words, it wasn't different landing gear, right? It no. had a tail hook. It was an F-4. Yeah. And they probably had some consternation with the amount of maintenance involved in some of those more complex and heavy components. But it was cheaper, presumably, to have one variant with a landing gear than to mix it up. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Now, we talked about it being an interceptor, but also a fighter bomber. What did it do well, in your opinions? I think it did well because it did everything. Uh, mm-hmm. I, it, you know, it was a, a photo version the, air, the, the Marines right. flew. Mm-hmm. It was a strike fighter, uh, in, not in the sense that the, the F-18 is today, right. but but pretty close in that it carried a lot of bombs. It carried ordnance, and, and the missions that we flew, about half of them were either bombing missions or flak suppression missions, mm-hmm. uh, and the other half were some kind of a pure fighter or fighter sweep uh, mm-hmm. mission. Yeah. And I think it, it, that's what its strength has been, always has been, is versatility. Right. And oftentimes it was both on the same mission. Yeah. Right. Between flak suppression or bomb, pull off, and then stay in the target area as a fighter. You just, you know, put the switches differently and you're still carrying missiles. So it could it could do both uh, missile, excuse me, missions on the same uh, right. same time. In fact, I think Duke and Willie D were doing a flak suppression when they shot down their third, fourth, and fifth. I don't know. I don't know. I had them on the show, and we talked about it. Lots maybe, happened maybe, since I then. So yeah. anyway, but, all right. Great. Well, let's talk the, through the variants. Now, you gentlemen, being Navy background, are probably familiar with the Navy ones. Uh, what did the Navy fly? Let's start with those. I mean, we've got almost A through Z on this thing, <laughs> but w- what did the Navy have? The only thing I ever flew was a F-4B in okay. combat because both the squadrons that uh, I was in were B models. Okay, and, and that was um, the initial variant, as I understand, about well, 650 of those a, made? The, the well, that F4, was like a prototype. The F-4A was a prototype, right. and then they were used in the training. But, the yeah, you know, that was the first operational one was the F-4B. Okay. Yeah. How about you, John A? Uh, I flew the Bs and then later the Ns, but my first fleet squadron was an F-4Js. The squadron had come back from Vietnam flying Bs, and they transitioned to the J model, and we had brand-new airplanes. It was a great time to be in the squadron. Oh, I bet. We were getting brand-new airplanes from <laughs> McDonnell Douglas. We still had about 10 F-4Bs on the, you know, on the flight line, so we had 20-some airplanes. Still smelled good, huh? The <laughs> new ones did. The old ones, not so much. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the F-4J was a great airplane, and then they modified it to the S model. I flew the S model at the end, and to me, that was by far and away the best F-4 right. ever built. Okay. Wonderful airplane. And was there one of those models where they made, finally, the smokeless engines? There are some ends that had smokeless engines. Mm, okay. I'm not sure if all of them did, but the S was the first truly smokeless engine, and it had an AUG-10 Alpha radar in it, an upgraded AUG-10, digitized uh, radar from the J. Yeah. So it was a better radar. It had maneuver slats, so it was a better turning airplane, oh. and it had smokeless engines. Oh, wow. Okay. And the highest thrust F-4 engines they've ever made. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, they were about 17,000 pounds. 18, 17, 18, 17, 9, is it? Yeah. Per engine? 
Burn in full afterburn. Yeah. So that's what the F-18 with the enhanced engines, the 402s, had in full afterburn. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Now, I forgot to ask, how many hours did you end up with in the aircraft? I ended up with a little over 3,000 in the F-4. Oh, wow. How about had, you, Fingers? Uh, oh, I didn't uh, warn you. I was going to ask you this. Yeah, I don't know. It was over... <laughs> Something 2000 with some zeros? Some, okay. 2000 All right. and something, I don't know, okay. change. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, so let's rattle through a few more of these. So like you said, the B was the initial operational variant used by both the Navy and the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. I think. And then the C was the first Air Force version. Mm-hmm. And by the way, they used to paint theirs different, right? Were they the olive green and we were more of the white, at least back in Vietnam? Well, we were the, you know, the gray. Uh, yeah. But a, a more of a brighter gray than they do now, or was it the... It was like, a gunmetal gray. Gunmetal gray. They okay. also had squadron, you know, colors on the, on the, on yeah. the airplanes back then. They didn't okay. go to full camouflage or... Or no. or the shaded grays until much later. Okay, after yeah. Vietnam, right? Yeah. And right. the B the B was uh, its radar was the the APQ seventy two, which was just a pulse radar, and uh, it was designed for intercept mm-hmm. over sea, and it it was terrible over land. It was all the ground return, everything like that. Oh, so gosh. it was it was not. And also one of the things they incorporated in, in the B was a. Um, IR detector right under the chin of the uh, oh sure of the supposedly pick up IR which which never worked and it was just you know <laughs> extra so weight extra way drag. to tell a, a B and a J because when when they bring out the J they got rid of that damn oh, they IR did. thing oh, oh yeah. so instead of adding something later they, they removed took it, it off yeah okay they took off something that didn't work yeah well they yeah. added something yeah. similar back on the F fourteen I guess uh, well that was the what the TCS but anyway yeah. Yeah. all right. So then they had a wild weasel variant, uh, the EF4C, but they later called that just the F4C, apparently. And the wild weasel being the seed mission, right? So suppression mm-hmm. of enemy air yeah. defenses. Did you guys ever do that? Did the Navy have a variant of that? No. We didn't have that variant, but that was a, the uh, A7s so were the, the primary mission right. uh, for the A7s, not, okay. the, not the primary mission. One of their missions of, was yeah. the A7s. Was All right. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, and then we had an F-4D, which was apparently an upgraded C model with the AIM-4 Falcon, which was, I guess, a giant missile for non-maneuvering bombers. Uh, I'm guessing there wasn't much of that employment. It was worthless. <laughs> okay. And then the E model, according to my notes, was the first one with the internal M61. True. But to your point earlier, Tiger, you know, we've said on this show before, an aircraft, like so many things in life, is a series of compromises. Yeah. And so you add a gun and you have the benefit of that very close-in weapon, but you pay a price, and that is with weight and maneuverability. In my opinion, my humble opinion, I think you pay a big price for that, yeah. especially with the F-4. Where did they mount it, actually, let me ask you? you under the it? nose. Under I, the... I'm not sure where the, where the magazine was, but the but it came out under, right underneath yeah, right, the nose. Right. So the gun is well forward, right. far forward. Yeah. As it is with the F-18, but the F-16 right. has it. They actually, yeah. The bullets actually leave the uh, barrels behind where the pilot's sitting in the wing route. So Ooh. they got a little smarter on that. So anyway, all right. So then they had the f 4 e Jay for Japan, who flew it for a number of years. They just uh, retired it. Did they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the F-4F was for Germany, but that was an E-model, basically. And then the F-4E turned in the F-4G for the Wild Weasel mission again. Uh, the, the Royal Navy flew it, apparently, the F-4K. And then the Royal Air Force flew it with the F-4M. And then we talked about the N and the S. And then there's one called the QF-4. Ever heard of one of those? Yeah. <laughs> what do they do with those fingers? They're a drone. They shoot them down. <laughs> I uh, I got to tour the line at uh, Mojave uh, where they're making. They were at that time they were making F four E's into Q F fours. Oh wow! And there's a fellow up there that was was flying the airplanes to Holloman Air Force Base to drop them off to be shot down. Mm. And he wherever he'd stop, he'd walk <clears> into base ops and said, "I'm flying an F four And they they they'd laugh at him. He said, "No, they don't exist anymore." <laughs> he said, "Well, that's out there on the flight line. You can go wow. see it." But yeah, they stopped making the QF-4s a number of years ago. I know they're, they're drone the F-16 now, so right. I don't know if that's a replacement for the QF-4 or Presumably, not. Presumably, yes. And the interesting thing with that is it wasn't like a, a one-way door. In other words, you could still fly, as I understand, a oh, sure. QF-4. Yeah. In fact, I believe the last mishap in an F-4 in the Navy, do you remember this, was at the Point Magoo Air Show. It was a reserve pilot. He was flying a QF-4, and I don't know if he hot-dogged or did something wrong, but at any rate, unfortunately, he crashed and I think was killed at an air show. Uh, one of the F-4s on um, display at the USS Midway Museum uh-huh. was in that Q program up at Magoo, and uh, the Navy ran out of money for it, and so they had four or five of them left, and uh, they were taking the wings off and trucking them over to Davis Motham. And uh, when we were developing the uh, display on a Midway, mm-hmm. I called 
the museum in Pensacola and said, we need an F-4B because that's the kind that uh, 21 and 161 flew when they got their MiGs, first and last MiGs off the Midway. And uh, Bob Rasmussen down there told me, he says, a good thing you called, he says, because the last of them were up in Magoo and um, they're being taken apart and trucked over there. So went through the, uh, the rigmarole of getting it and they got it approved and they, they kept one and they flew it down here to oh, um, flew North down. Island. Wow. <laughs> and, cool. from, and came into North Island where it was going to be repainted and turned into the display. Hmm. And that's the last Navy Marine F-4 ever to be airborne. Wow. And, he, and the crew did, do, did a shit hot thing. They came in <laughs> to North Island and they broke in burner. Oh. <laughs> so, and then it was turned into the display. That's cool. Well, I'm sure they rattled some windows in Coronado. Hopefully oh, yeah. nobody complained too much. That's I live right. over there and I love the noise, but I know a lot of the residents do not. So, and we still get aircraft coming in and out of there. All right. So that was the QF4. And then John Ed, you said earlier, the RF4. So a reconnaissance variant. And right. It had a different mm-hmm. nose, I think, right? It had a different nose uh, for all the cameras and it was a fast airplane. Mm. Not unlike the F-8. The RF-8 was a little faster than the, the fighter F-8. And I, I think the uh, RF-4 was probably a little bit faster also. Okay. Lighter, too. Nothing like the Vigi, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, speaking of the F-8, on this podcast some time ago, I'm not sure when this episode will air, but it's recent for when we're recording this, we had a gentleman... Jerry Tucker, you got my, my you note? Use, you used that word lightly, didn't you? Gentlemen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he seemed to think that the F-8 was superior to the F-4. Now, he's not here to defend himself, but we could replay some clips if needed. Did you gentlemen ever get a chance to fight the F-8? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I fought the F-8 a lot, both yeah. uh, in the F-4 and the Top Gun in the, in the A-4. And it's a great airplane. It and, is, yeah. and I think they, they had a, a, a spree and a fighter spirit that right. was unmatched. I'll yeah. give them that. Okay. Yeah. However... <laughs> The airplane was not a match for, especially an F-4S, uh, mm-hmm. and a well-flown F-4S. And the, the, the other aspect that if they lost sight, there's one person mm-hmm. that didn't have good aft visibility. If they mm-hmm. lost sight, they're a toast, and they, right. they didn't have a chance to, to regain it because we had two sets of eyes instead of one, and that, that helped a lot, I think, especially if, if you had ever had somebody over your shoulder, shoulder that you had to look at. Right. And in a multiple plane environment, it's even harder. Yeah. Right. To that point, a higher percentage of first sights of MiGs in the Vietnam War were made by the real. In an F-4? In an F-4. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Wow. Because, uh, you know, like John says, the that second set of eyes, mm-hmm. especially, we didn't have anything. Once you got in a fight, you didn't have to worry about anything about looking outside. Right. Because he had his hands full up front just doing that pilot stuff. But, you know, the God love him. Uh, you know, you, you got to love your first airplane. I, I always, the <laughs> F-4 is still my favorite airplane. And, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah. We'll give Turkey a uh, benefit of the doubt. <laughs> All right, fair <laughs> enough. Hey, let's go off script for a second on that, though, Fingers, because the F-18 and F-16 operationally, single seat mostly, we do have the F-18F, and the Marine Corps has the D. Mm-hmm. But now when you talk about the F-22, the F-35... All single seat going forward. In fact, even yeah. in training, they're all single seat. Oh, yeah. What are your gentlemen's opinions on that? Because granted, technology is getting good. There's a lot of information available at your fingertips. But I would argue there's still something to be said. I was only operational in a single seat squadron, but I did fly a little bit with some two seat squadrons, and I see it. But what do you gentlemen think of only single seat theoretically going forward? I, my sense is that... There's a lot of advantages for, for two seats, but with the technology today and the, and the fusion of all the information that you can get mm. inside the cockpit, you have a, m- a much better sense of, of what's going on around you than we ever had in, right, the, yeah. in the Phantom days. Yeah. And the Phantom needed two people uh, to run the radar, to run the weapon system, and the pilot to fly. And I, I think that his technology has made great leaps. Uh, right. And I don't know, the F-35 as an example, though, if it ever gets in a dogfight, I think it's going to be in trouble. Mm-hmm. One from a new maneuverability perspective and from a visual yeah. per- perspective. But And it's uh, a single engine. Never, and it's a single engine, but hopefully it'll never get there. <laughs> well, doesn't that remind you, though, of 50 years ago? Yeah. I I get this question sometimes on my show is, oh, the F-35 is so good. Do you think this is the end of dogfighting? And, of course, I used to wear light blue also, and I think I'm never going to say that. Uh, look, that's how we got in this mess in the first place. Well, I, I, I got to agree with John about the technology and everything is I mean, you know, we were in you know, comparatively dark ages compared to what they do today. <laughs> I my first experience with ECM gear was in the 66 cruise on Coral Sea. And that's electronic countermeasures. Yeah, mm-hmm. electronic countermeasures, yeah. And because um, we didn't have any de- 
you know, anything installed in the airplane. We had something they called little ears. You know what that was? Remember that? I don't. <laughs> it was a radar detector on, with a receiver on the suction cup, which you <laughs> licked and put on the wind sh- on the can on the canopy when you went over the beach, and you had a, like you're listening to your iPod, uh, iPad or something yeah, like that. Earbud. And we had a trainer in the ready room with all the various frequencies of a fan song when it was tracking, when it when locked on, when mm-hmm. it shot and all that stuff. And you were supposed to memorize those and listen to that. Wow. Then after that cruise, that's when they started the shoehorn program where they started uh, retrofitting the AKLs and, and all that stuff into the airplanes themselves. Wow. But that was my first experience. So, okay. I mean, you talk about... Uh, Rube uh, Goldberg. Uh, Rube Goldberg, <laughs> yeah. And, and the, as far as... yeah. Two seat to one seat. Uh, I think, like John said, I think you know technology and everything. But mm. with your head, you got to say that. But with the heart, as a real, you know, you're driving <laughs> us out of our job. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I, I assume someone smart is making the intelligent, informed decision. But I, I'm not Jello, sure what else to you say. Know about what assume does? Yes, yeah. I do. So anyway, mm-hmm. uh, and I just want to make a comment on the fan song, in case our listener is not aware. That is the radar associated oh. with the SA-2, as we know it, yes. guideline missile, which was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the percentage threat. I mean, that was like a flying telephone pole. Yep. You guys feared that, and it brought down a lot of aircraft yeah. in Vietnam. I know, I know okay. it well. <laughs> All right. And then just finishing up on the variants, of course, many countries flying the F-4, including some still presently. Uh, let's see, Iran is flying it right now. And I think, did I hear Turkey maybe? I'll have to double back on that and I can put some notes in at the end. But at one time, Australia, Egypt, Germany, Greece, Iran, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Spain, Turkey, the UK, and of course, the US. Mm-hmm. Pretty prolific aircraft. And the UK, uh, after the Falklands War, the UK had the F-4 and uh, they needed some more. So uh, a fellow at Top Gun, Steve Queen, was one of the pilots that went to davis Mothin to take F-4Js out of the inventory at davis Mothin and fly them back to UK because they needed airplanes, they needed wow. Phantoms to stand alert in the Falkland Islands after they had retaken the Falklands. No kidding. Wow. Well, this thing has quite the storied history. All right, so we touched a little bit on why does it look... I'd have to say that... Yes, sir. uh, The F-4 was probably one of the best weapon systems of of bargain that our nation ever bought. I mean, think of all that uh, services have used it around Mm -hmm. the world and everything like that. And what was the cost of a Phantom back in those days? Of course, Escalation and everything like that. I think it was two point five million dollars of the cost of an airplane. What's the thir- F thirty five? Oh, it's over a hundred. Thirty five million dollars. No, I think no, that F eighteen was thirty five. I think yeah, it's over a hundred. Is it? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. so. They're, they're pretty. They're up there. But to your point, a five dollar bill used to get you something back That's then, true. and it doesn't That's get true. you much. That's no, almost I, a yeah. tip for a guy who opens a door for you these That's days. Right. So anyway, let's not go off on a tangent. All right. On our show and our sister productions before, our co-host Sunshine, who couldn't make it tonight, has talked a little bit about the, why the F4 looks the way it does. Uh, but for starters, we already talked about two-person uh, tandem-seated twin engine for the carrier. That was, we always thought, the smartest thing to do, and now we seem to be back to single engine. But also, the wings have an interesting shape, and so do the horizontal stabilizers. And could one of you kindly remind us of why it looks the way it does as far as that goes? It's like any, Let's let, let the pilot take <laughs> it's, it's like any aerodynamicist. You have to have compromises. And, right. And the airplane, like a lot of airplanes that are built to fly Mach 2+, plus, mm. uh, have difficulty slowing down getting aboard ship and doing uh, any kind of a hard maneuvering at high angle of attack or at low speed. Mm. So the wing has a dihedral of about 12 degrees outside of the wing fold. Right. Inside the wing fold, it's, it's a standard swept wing airplane. And it has an anhedral in the tail for the stabilizer uh, to help slow speed characteristics in pitch right. uh, for coming aboard the ship. Both features uh, were compromises, I guess, to a certain extent that they figured out in the wind tunnel tests, mm. but they have been, it's been an effective uh, use of the of aerodynamics. Right. And it gives it, I would say, a very distinct look. Like when you drive mm-hmm. down the road today, all sedans look the same, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't tell if it's a Mercedes or BMW or whatever, because I presume the highway safety board requires certain safety features mm-hmm. and that drives a certain design. But back then, boy, the F4, it's distinct. Yeah. And I think that wing design, the dihedral you're talking about too, is, wasn't that also what resulted in getting the dog teeth on the front of the each uh, because yep. of the way they 
they needed that uh, also for yeah. maneuverability and the high angle of attack too. Right. And is that where the wing fold occurs? Is where yes. the mm-hmm. dihedral? Okay. And the dihedral I, and, and the and the dog tooth all at gotcha. the same time. Okay. Yeah. And if I remember from Sunshine's deep dive correctly, the engineer said, well, the whole wing needs a five degree dihedral, but some smart person said, well, if we just do the wing tips, we do them at 12. And then the benefit is for the landing gear, for example, they don't have to be quite so long like I said on A4, although that's for a different reason. But anyway, like you said, series of compromises and the design ended up being the way it is. And I think it's a good looking airplane. I mean, (laughs) beautiful airplane. (laughs) (laughs) You bet. All right. Let's talk armament. Now, what could this carry, or is it easier to say what it couldn't carry? Because it seemed to me like it did uh, almost everything. We talked about versatility earlier, and I think that's its, its strong mm-hmm. suit. And, mm-hmm. and the armament that it carried was a reflection of its extreme versatility. Mm. I only flew uh, the airplane with uh, Mark 82s and Mark 83s bombs, 500,000-pound okay. yeah. bombs. Right. And, of course, all the, the missiles we had were AIM-7s and AIM-9s. Um, but it could carry rock eyes, so I did carry rock eyes. I forgot about That's that. That's a cluster yeah. munition. Cluster mm-hmm. munition. Mm-hmm. Cluster bomb. Yeah. Um, but the Air Force carried a bunch of other munitions. Uh, the Navy pretty much stuck to uh, with the Phantom, with the Mark 82s and rock eyes as far as okay. air to ground. But in 1972, uh, we were doing some experiments in North Vietnam with the laser-guided bombs. So we were dropping laser-guided bombs in 1972 out of the Phantom with a handheld laser in the back seat, if you can believe <laughs> yeah. that. I had a mission over VIN. At, uh, we were at 10,000 feet, and the bombing, which happened to be the, the AAA uh, training site for North Vietnam, and we, I was in the airplane at 10,000 feet doing circles while the other guys were rolling in. We, we were designating, the, the, the RO was designating the target with his handheld laser. That was yes. Little Ears Redux. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing, the workarounds. And to a degree, there's still some of that today, I would say. But um, yeah, handheld, well, that's impressive. I mean, did it have like a giant battery or did you plug it into the aircraft or what did you do? I think it plugged I, I into the aircraft. We had to wear special glasses too. For, right, because of the, the side uh, lobes yeah, and yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, crazy. <laughs> yeah, the Phantom was, I mean, my God, it, we talked about the, what it could carry. Mm-hmm. It, it could carry a, a bigger payload than a... B like seventeen, B seventeen. Flying, that's right. Flying fortress. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, almost twice as much. I and think. employ it more accurately. Yeah. yeah. The Marines yeah. carried a lot because they were ground based and they had very short missions. Right. They go off with a lot of bombs. Oh, the yeah. Most I ever carried was twelve Mark eighty twos. Wow. So I think that's on that, out. That's <laughs> ones. That's as much. But as then I you ever. had to carry. You had to put a sparrow right to off the sparrow forward to offset mm. the CG. Yeah. And a tur is a triple ejector rack, right? So it's like yes. a, an adapter to put more than one mm-hmm. on one spot. So you carry okay. six on each six wow. on each wing station. Mm-hmm. And of course, the difference for the Marines, if they're shore-based, is they can come back and land, theoretically, if they don't employ. But when you are coming back to the ship, you have to be a certain weight, and it's either bombs or fuel. Correct. And that is a that is a compromise for sure. Yeah, we never um, brought any bombs back. <laughs> no, not then. Well, in my career, most of what I did was patrolling, so usually I brought it back. All right. Um, let's see. How about rockets? Were rockets involved at all? We carry two point seven five rockets. Uh, oh, rocket oh, oh rockets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sir. But but yeah. I I don't. Not we that fired much. Zunis. We carried Zunis in training. I don't ever right. remember carrying a Zuni in on a combat mission. I don't. Okay. I don't think so either. I don't remember it. Any Zunis. Uh-huh. Okay. Fair enough. And then for other missiles, of course, when other countries bought or obtained the F-4, then they could adapt their own weapons. So I read that the uh, UK adapted the Sky Flash. I think Greece had the Iris T. Japan had the AAM-3, and Israel had yeah. the Python-3. So, of course, and that's still happening. I mean, yeah. Israel's putting different weapons on their F-16s sure. and F-15s. So, all right, pretty standard. All right, how about performance? Now, what's the highest, fastest, most Gs? What? There's book answers, I realize, and the F-4 set a lot of records when it was brand new. Of course, they do that with every aircraft, even the Streak Eagle, if you remember. Yeah. They didn't even paint the thing. They just wanted the F-15 to set a bunch of records to justify some whatever. But um, the F-4 did set a lot of records. I read that one flew as high as 90,000 feet, but that seems hard to believe. 98. <laughs> Yeah, well, Were you in it? it? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. But what was uh, what was your gentleman's personal highest, fastest, most Gs? I never went uh, – I have friends that will be re- remain nameless <laughs> that went way over 50,000 feet without a pressure suit. Okay. You're not supposed to do that. No, that's the dangerous. The fellow at 98,000 feet was, uh, was in a pressure suit. But the B was, I think, the fastest of the airplanes because it had the thinnest wing. Yeah. Okay. It didn't have the fat tires. And I had a, a, a B up to Mach 2.2. 
Wow. That was the fastest I've ever been in any kind of airplane. Much faster than I ever flew the F-14. So. Do you remember, did you have a ground speed readout or anything? I don't remember what okay, it was. Yeah. Uh, faster than the F-14, okay. Yeah, well, I All never right. went above 1.5 in the F-14, I don't think, because there were restrictions in the F-14 later on right. you know, uh, that, that greatly restricted its top end speed. It was okay. a fast airplane mm -hmm. and a quick to accelerate airplane, especially unloaded. But the, uh, the F-4 flat out could really fly fast. And fly high, but you know, I, fly high was never something that excited me. So. No, no, but no. Yeah. I, uh, mine was well, fast as I was ever in. It was in B two, and it was a two point one Mach, and wow. uh, just over fifty thousand feet, fifty one something. I think cause that's Muggs and I went up in the <laughs> and the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sky's pretty dark above yeah, you. Yeah. You see uh, the the. Uh, Roundness, the roundness, and of, the darkness of the horizon, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we said, oh, let's, "Let's get back down <laughs> out of this thing." But it, uh, it was, it was a one-time shot. Yeah, but uh, said we did it. I think I got to fifty-four-ish in an F eighteen, and same thing. It's like it would keep going. It, this was a naked right out of the depot, lot twenty-one with the big engines, mm -hmm. and it would keep going. But I thought, man, if something happens now, pressurization problem-wise, I'm really hosed so That's right. i i stopped and came back down but it was yeah. towards the end anyway and i wanted to set a personal best how about g's uh, i think if i remember correctly about seven or so but yeah the seven was, was normal seven six normal. and a half was was routine okay. uh it could go at certain weights uh, it could go to eight without an overstress all right but back when i was flying and and, and getting ready for vietnam we flew them hard yeah and we had a lot of uh, a lot of high g fights uh and they're hard on you they're hard on your body too oh, yeah especially if it's a sustained high G. And you talked about strengths and weaknesses. I think that's one of the strengths of the Phantom. It had so much thrust that it could sustain a high G turn for a long, long period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Okay. I think uh, most I can remember was probably eight. Eight Gs? Eight Gs, something like that is uh, the best I can remember. Huh. Well, let's talk about strengths and weaknesses, Tiger. So the sustained in that case, what else? I mean, speed is obviously a strength, can be at times. How about the ability to regain energy when you were in a fight? In the F-18, that's a bit of a hindrance. In the F-16, it's definitely an advantage. How about in the F-4? Were you able to regain energy quickly? Yes, if you could unload. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. the secret. you got to unload the airplane right. to, get, to get the energy back. Mm -hmm. If you start at corner velocity 425 or so, you could you could sustain it for a very long period of time. But mm -hmm. if, you needed, if you got slow, you needed to get it back. If you unload, it would come back very quickly. Mm -hmm. All right. How about in the cockpit itself? Was that a, how was it compared to, I mean, I guess you can't compare it to modern aircraft, but was it reasonably easy to do your job in the cockpit front and back or were there workarounds? I mean, there were workarounds. how was the visibility? By the the visibility was pretty good. It wasn't anything like an F-14, no. but, but the, the, initially uh, the system was set up, the switch from the heat to the radar, whether you're shooting an IR missile or a radar missile, mm -hmm. was a switch down in front of you that had a little tiny, it, it was like the F-14 comment that was, it was, was talked about. There are a bunch of switches up there, and they're all the same. Well, the one you really need is when you want to switch from a radar missile to a, to a, a, to a heat-seeking missile, that's and right. that's the one that's critical. So we've put a little extra extension on that particular switch. <laughs> And it was, you know, it was a, right. it was, it was a ten cent extension, but it worked. It was a piece of plastic, okay. yeah, and that was, was like a little piece of rubber hose, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. And and later on, the the F four S and all the and mm -hmm. the J all had everything on the stick again. Hotas, uh, right? Hotas, Hands yes. on throttle and stick. It made okay. a world of difference. It's yeah. so much more user friendly. So the b problem being, if you need to take your hand off the stick or throttle to find a switch, oh by the way, take your eyes off something, then you are compromising in your maneuvering. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any other strengths? I keep coming back to this, but I think the airplane was around for so long and, and so many were built because mm -hmm. of its versatility. And right. I think that's its greatest strength. Me too. Okay. How about bringing aboard ship? Was it f forgiving? It's a great airplane landing. It's a difficult airplane off the cat. Yeah. The off the cat. Yeah. I, all the, I, I'm still mar I still marvel at the F-18 pilots that take off <laughs> with both hands. Yeah. Pete Pettigrew <laughs> went on about this in yeah. our uh, Real Viper episode. Yes. It's, it's crazy. But the F-4... Its center of gravity was close enough to the center of pressure that if you, you had to rotate the airplane or you're going to go in the water. Mm -hmm. So you have to rotate. And so wow. the, the technique was to full aft stick and then a, a, a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. And depending on how heavy you were, the little bit more forward you went with the stick. Wow. But you had to catch it at the end of the stroke or you were going to over it. I've seen plan forms of F4s uh, right off the, you had 60 feet in the air and in mm -hmm. full burner just to try to fly away. 
because they over rotated, and that was a common a common occurrence, I guess. I've that been I've been in a couple of those platforms. <laughs> you know. Oh, did they keep flying or uh, did? Oh yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we've kept flying, but I mean it's um. You're you know, walking on the on you're, the rudders, and you're walking the wing, <laughs> walking it up in the air, and finally getting up there. But it's a. Uh, he took it right at Disney World in the back seat. Yeah, yeah, no, I wow, can man. imagine. Um, did but they com- ha- coming aboard yeah. though, on the on the other yeah. end, uh, it was a very very stable airplane in that yeah. regard. Okay. And uh, again, harkening back to 1970s, early 70s, we had an ACLS system, automatic carry landing system, in the Phantom. My first cruise in wow. 1971, and it was pretty good. It didn't work all the time, but uh, when it worked, it was it worked it, pretty well. Uh, it, it was built into the J originally, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And then retrofitted to the bees. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Hey, Jello. What a great interview, though. I got to admit, though, dude, I'm kind of saturated at this point. So maybe we should <laughs> we should kind of knock it off, knock it off, if you will, and we'll uh, yeah. save it for another, the rest of it for another day. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, boy, that's, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun so far. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just do a quick, normal kind of ending here, and we'll pick it back up without a lot of fanfare next time. But let me just remind everyone that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So hang tight with us for a few days, maybe as much as a week, and we'll be right back with part two of the F4 Phantom 2. See ya. See you then. 